one in First Peter five. All right, we'll read those in a minute, so I'm not, you don't have to stand. We're not going to do a, a text reading, but um, I want to preach here on, you know, I was just doing a little study here a while back and thinking through this and wanted to study it and give it some time, and it had to do with Peter. You know, we're spending a lot of time in John, preaching in John, and I've made a few jokes about John and Peter being in competition, and, and uh, uh, sometimes, you know, we mentioned John, I mean, uh, Peter, I was just thinking about uh, when we talked about walking on the water last week, how one of the accounts shows Peter getting in the water as well, and and uh, walking on water there for a minute, and, and there's a whole lot in the Bible about Peter, there's no doubt about that, and specifically, I was thinking about Peter in the book of Acts, and um I originally titled the message that before I had all my studying done, just Peter in the book of Acts. And it sounds like I'm getting ready to do a series and it would be quite a big series because he's in the book of Acts a lot. There's a lot that he's doing, but I pretty much just had one thought that I was trying to study and, and to turn into a message, but uh, it's not necessarily something I want to do a series on. So it's more about Peter's authority over Christ's church. The thought that Christ leading his church he goes up to heaven, leads, leaves the church uh, in the hands of Peter. And of course, the Catholics today make a big deal about that, Peter being the first pope, and then that was authority is passed down and, and all that stuff. Well, we don't agree with their uh, thinking on that at all, but you know, I do definitely believe that there was some authority given to Peter at the very beginning. Um, and then we see you know, several things happen in the book of Acts where the story even starts following Paul, who wasn't leading the church necessarily. He was starting churches, and, and it takes a little bit of a different turn. But there is some plenty in the Bible, I think, for us to look at when studying this. And, uh, you know, again, thinking through what Jesus was doing with Peter in the Gospels as we read the story. And, you know, Peter was a, I mean, a, a devout guy, he loved the Lord, and I, I really feel like he was sincere in his desire to, um, to serve the Lord even. There are many times he rebuked Jesus, which sounds like a terrible thing to do, but what he was saying is, not so, Lord, I'm, not, I'm never going to leave you. Not so, Lord, you know, uh, he's just always defending him and saying, we're going to be here, we're going to serve you, we're going to protect you. And then, you know, there's Jesus's get thee behind me, Satan. And he's saying all these things. But what he's doing is working on John, uh, Peter's heart. I keep saying John. Because God, remember, Jesus knows the heart. You know, he's God and he knows the heart. He knew all the people that he, were, he was dealing with. He knew what their problems were, their struggles were. So no surprise that he knew all that. But he was working on Peter. Um, he was uh, rebuking him a lot, for sure. Uh, but then... We also have Peter being humbled when he says, I'll never deny you. And then he denies him three times after his arrest. And so that weighed heavy on Peter's heart. But then after the resurrection, you can see him coming to him and saying, hey, feed my sheep. You know, for, for an example, we'll read that here in a little bit, Lord willing. But I want to look at how Peter handled these responsibilities and how what it looks like, you know, how he was... Uh, taking over the uh, the church there. Obviously, it's still Christ's church, but he had this responsibility to lead it and to head it up. Okay, so that's the first thing I want to talk about. There's only two points. It won't be a long or uh, really super deep message or anything, but um, the first point I want to bring out is that Peter takes charge of the church. Okay, so if you look at Acts chapter 1, And let's start with uh, let's start with verse ten. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, "Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus which is taken up from you in heaven shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven." It, then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. And when they were come in, they went up into an upper room 
where abode both Peter and James and John, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon Zelotes, and Judas, the brother of James. These all continued with one accord in praying and supplic and, and prayer and supplication with the women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. And in, these, and in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, the number of the names together were about um, 120, Men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. For he was numbered with us and has to attain, had attained part of this ministry. Now this field purchased, uh, now, sorry, now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity and falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst and all his bowels gushed out. And it was known unto all the dwellers at Jerusalem inasmuch as the field is called in their proper tongue, Akeldama, which is to say the field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his habitation be desolate and let no man dwell therein and his bishopric let another take. Wherefore of these men, uh, which have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out from among, out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. And they appointed two, Joseph called Barsabas, whose name is Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether these two thou hast um, show whether of these two thou hast chosen, that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship uh, from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. All right, so we notice that right from the beginning, as they're standing around, wondering what to do next, there's 120, you know, that are there. And I would just assume that naturally they look to Peter, but, you know, Peter also had historically, as we'll look at here in a minute, a habit of, of just kind of going and doing his own thing. <laughs> you know, uh, he didn't necessarily, he wasn't, that we can see, we don't actually have proof that he was a take charge kind of a guy necessarily. Uh, but in this case, he stands up. Somebody needs to take charge. So he stands up. And of course, we know Christ had given him that charge. And uh, now, uh, as they're looking up to him, we see that he stands up. Now, a few things about Peter. Now, one thing is speculated. Many people assume that Peter was maybe the oldest of the apostles. Some of the apostles could have been young. Um, seems like most of them would have been old enough to follow him and not be with their parents. But uh it seems like maybe Peter was the oldest. We don't have necessarily proof of that, but that's typically thought. One of the things we see about Peter um, is that he was married. Now, there's indication later that the other apostles got married as well, but uh, we know for sure Peter had a mother. It said Jesus, they went, Jesus and the disciples, they went to Peter's wife's mother's house, his, his mother-in-law's house, okay? And so that we don't know much about his wife. It doesn't say a lot about that, but we understand that he was married, and so there's a sense of responsibility that he has there, and it uh, seems as though uh, this is one of the things that lend itself to him being a leader. And then go back to John chapter 21, you know, keep your place marked in, in Acts 1 and then also First Peter, but in John 21... It seems like another thing we see about Peter is that, like I said, he doesn't necessarily stand up and take charge, but it seems like people naturally just followed him for whatever reason. They looked to him um, to see what he was going to do. So John 21, verse 1, After these things Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and on this wise showed he himself. There were together Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus and Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee and the, the, and the sons of Zebedee and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said unto them, I go a fishing. They say unto him, we also go with thee. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately and that night they caught nothing. But 
When the morning uh, was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not it was Jesus. Then Jesus said unto them, Children, have ye any meat? They answered him, No. And he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and, they, and ye shall find. They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. Sounds familiar? This happened once before to them, right? Therefore the disciples, uh, uh, the disciple whom Jesus loved, said unto Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked, meaning he didn't have that coat on, uh, and did cast himself into the sea. And the other disciples came in a little ship, for they were not far from land, but as it were two hundred cubits, dragging the net with fishes. As soon then as they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals there and fish laid thereon and bread. Jesus saith unto them, bring of the fishes which ye have now, uh, uh, now caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net uh, to land full of great fishes and a hundred and fifty and three. If you know, every fisherman is going to count how many fish he caught. And for all, uh, there were so many yet not, uh, yet was not the net broken. Jesus saith unto them, Come and dine, and none of the disciples durst ask him, Who art thou, knowing that it was the Lord? And uh, as you keep reading a couple of verses down, it says, So when they had dined, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He said unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest I love thee. He said unto him, Feed my lambs. He said unto him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He said unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest uh, that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith unto him a third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him a third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, Feed my sheep. So, we get this. Uh, many have caught th this. It's not new to me, but I think it's, there's a good argument here. He said it three times, probably representing the three times Jesus, I mean, uh, Peter j denied Jesus. And I'm sure that would have me meant something to Peter. And so, Jesus is kind of reminding him of that. And he's also at the same time saying, hey, if you love me, your job is that you feed my sheep. So you can see even in that how Jesus is kind of giving that to him. But the reason that they were even there in the boat fishing in the first place, and of course the Lord used this, but it's just because Peter said, hey, I'm going fishing. <laughs> you know, He had left the nets and he had given up fishing a long time ago and became, and became a follower of Jesus. But now at this time it's just like, yeah, I'm going fishing. And there are some people, and I believe Peter was one of these people, who just have an ability to like... You know, people just look up to them. And if they go do something, the people want to do it too, which is a great thing for a leader to be if the leader, if the leader is going to lead people right so that they'll follow the Lord and that they'll, they'll make the right decisions, they'll be wise. But you know what? That same person has great potential to lead people away from the Lord too. So a uh, person that has that natural ability to gain followers and to gain a following, I mean, a, 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 a you know, people look up to them and want to follow them. Yeah, that could be a bad thing. It could be a dangerous thing. But at the same time, uh, I believe this was the case with Peter. And so naturally, since he had that, and Jesus obviously gave him some kind of a charge over these disciples after the resurrection. Now, in this case, we see in Acts chapter 1, you can go back there, that Peter stands up and he takes charge. Somebody needs to take action. You know what I mean? Uh, there's been a lot of situations and I'm not the natural leader. I'm not the type that stands up and usually says, I know let, we'll do this. I'm usually more of a follower to be honest with you. That's just my nature is just wait, let somebody else take charge and tell me what to do. And, uh, but the reality is sometimes people just need a leader. They just need somebody, you know, they might not be the most qualified. They might not be the best, but they just need somebody who will stand up and say, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you, let's do this. And then they're probably thinking in their mind, I sure hope this is the right decision. <laughs> I mean, look, uh, speaking from my experience here. Uh, but you know what? Sometimes it just takes somebody to stand up and uh, uh, to take charge, you know. Uh, now, obviously, it also takes somebody to follow that person <laughs> or else they're wasting their time. Somebody once told me if, uh, if you think that you are a, a leader and nobody's following you, then you're just going for a walk. <laughs> and so uh, that sounds like, you know, me sometimes. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but when it comes to situations like this and leading this church, 
Peter was the one who had to stand up and make the decision. But notice this, you know, you, we could say, we could look at some stories from Peter in the Gospels and we could point fingers and we can say that he was this way or he was that way. But we see a pretty good example set out for us in the book of Acts. And I want you to notice that, um, you know, he doesn't take more authority than he should. Um, I got ahead of myself a little bit, but I don't want to go there yet. We'll go to first Peter here in a second and I'll hopefully remember to tell you something, but Acts, Acts chapter one, let's look at verse 15 again. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, a number of the names together were about 120 men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy ghost by the mouth of David spake. Okay. So, you know, he's just saying, Hey, something needs to be done. We need to elect a person to replace Judas. Now, I don't know if he really needed to do that. You know, is Jesus commanding? Sit down. Vivian, sit down. On your bottom. You listen to Braden, Zachary. All right. So, uh, so I don't know for sure if, uh, if they needed to do this, there's, it's kind of controversial. Some people, I mean, it's all speculatory, but some people say, you know, that Matthias really wasn't supposed to be picked. You know, Paul was the one who was going to fulfill that role. And so I don't know, but at the same time, whether or not we have proof that, that, G, that the Lord wanted Peter to do this, it's like, Hey, somebody had to do something. And he's looking and saying, you know what we ought to do? We ought to pick somebody. This is the way I look at it. But, uh, but we see that as we follow on, it's not like Peter said, you know what? Somebody else has to replace him. I'm going to pick who it is. If you read carefully, he says, hey, you know what? Choose from among you two people. And so that's what they do. And they give him uh, Bar Barnab uh, Bar I can't remember his name now. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, Barsabas and, Matt and Matthias. And so... Uh, and then, not only that, he lets them choose the two, it looks like, right? Because he says, they appointed two. And then verse 24, it says, And they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knoweth the hearts of all men, show whether of these two thou hast chosen. Okay, so you could read that and say, like, see, the Lord was the one who picked picked him. But, you know, sometimes, and I, I'm getting off track now, and I don't mean to go down a rabbit trail, but uh, sometimes all that we can do is, is make the best decision that we can. And then just leave it in God's hands and say, like, I've made this decision. What do you want to do? And in this case, it could be that the Lord gave him an answer and said, you know what? You're going to choose lots. I'm going to allow the lot to fall on uh, Matthias. Okay. Uh, but none of that, that's all, you know, it's, none of that's super important to know whether or not he was supposed to do that or not supposed to do that. What I want to just show you is that Peter rises up. And he decides, hey, I'm going to take the oversight of this group. Now I want you to see his words. Go to 1 Peter 5. First Peter 5. And he gives his introduction here. Simon Peter, servant of the apostle Jesus. Grace and peace be unto you, verse 2. Uh, and then look at verse four. Oh no, that's not where I want to go. Let's see. Uh, I'm sorry. First Peter five, that was chapter one. You're probably looking, you're probably wondering what in the world I'm talking about. First Peter chapter five. All right. So, um, he says, uh, the elders, which are among you, I exhort who am also an elder. And a witness of the suffering of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. So we see that um, that Peter is an elder here, you know, and now he meets the qualifications. He was married, you know, as, as for one thing. And so uh, so anyway, that's another subject for uh, subject for another day. But uh, but he says here he's an elder also. And here's what he's admonishing to these other elders. He says, feed the flock of God. Which is over, which is among you, isn't that what Jesus told him to do? Feed my sheep, right? And so he feeds the flock, and he's telling the other elders to do the same. But look, he says, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly. Meaning, hey, your job as an elder is not to wait for someone to say, hey, you're the one in charge. You you take the oversight. No, 
just do it willingly. <laughs> you take the, somebody needs to stand up and take the oversight. And so Peter is this man. He is like, you could say, the pastor of the, the church there in Jerusalem after Jesus um, ascends. And so, but the second thing that I brought up was that Peter also didn't go too far. He wasn't just like, you know what, I'll make all the decisions here. No, he takes the oversight, but in his oversight, he delegates and he defers to other people. And I think that's an important thing that we can learn from Peter's leadership. Uh, and that's what happens when somebody is just taking charge, but they don't necessarily want to steal the show and get all the credit. They're just, you know, uh, they're just doing what they can to take charge. They'll probably defer to other people that can make better decisions and stuff like that. And so, uh, so here's what he says as we go down in first Peter five, not second Peter one, he says, take the uh, oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Verse three, neither as being Lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. So he's saying, you know, take the oversight, not by constraint, but willingly. And when you take it, like you're not trying to be, you know, get filthy lucre. You're not trying to be a lord over God's heritage and be some kind of king or master over them. You're just taking it as a, to be an example to the people and to provide leadership and to help them know what to do next. And so this seems to be the mind of Peter whenever he takes this, uh, this place. And along with that is this um, point that we see back in Acts chapter 1, or I think we're, we're done with chapter 1 here. Go to Acts 15. Acts chapter 15. So along with this, yes, number one was that he took charge of the church. You know, he, he willingly took the leadership. Of course, Jesus had uh, put that on him. But number two, he was content to let others lead when it was their place to lead. And, where we, and we see this, you know, really clearly here with the church of Jerusalem. Now, Histor the hi history tells us, and of course, who writes the history, who writes the tradition? It's mostly the Catholic Church that we have all these records from. I don't believe a lot of stuff that they say. Uh, but in this point, I can get from the Bible, it seems to make lots of sense. They say that Peter became the elder or the bishop over Antioch, okay, which is became the hub of Christianity, you know, that Christ, they were first called Christians in Antioch. And it seems like as you are reading later on in the book of Acts that Peter is in charge of Antioch, which means he was originally leading the disciples and the 120 people there in Jerusalem, but now he's moved to Antioch, but now they're, they're taking this matter back to the church of Antioch to the disciples, and namely we see one man stepping up who is apparently the new bishop over J Jerusalem, which is James. Okay, so Acts chapter 15, let's start in verse 13. And after they had said their peace, James ans answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Simon hath declared how God at the first did visit Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. Remember, he had that revelation with the sheet and it had all the animals uh, in it, the clean and unclean. He's saying that, you know, don't call unclean what I call clean. And to this agree the words of the prophets as it is written. After this, I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. And I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord. And all the Gentiles upon whom, whom my name is called, saith the Lord, uh, who doeth these things, known unto God are all his works uh, from the beginning of the world. Wherefore, my sentence is... That we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God. And you don't need to hear the rest of the sentence, but you see, like he's saying, like, here is my, um, here is my final word. Here's my sentence is the word that he uses. Uh, this is what I'm declaring here. I'm making the final decision. And it's like, well, who gives James the authority to do that? Well, I believe he is now put into that position 
and Peter's authority is now over into um, the uh, church of Antioch. Okay, so <clears throat> what does that mean? What, what, what's so significant about that? Well, it shows us that Peter saw himself as a minister of God. And this is a great thing for preachers to learn about, like pa for pastors to learn about, is that when they are in a place of authority over a church, they're ministers. You know what I mean? They're not leading, you know, they're not there because they're just the greatest person and they're just, uh, you know, this master over everybody. <laughs> they have to do what they tell them to do. And there's a reputation that some preachers get of being that way, kind of dictators and stuff like that. Uh, sometimes it's not, you know, it's, it's, it's unrightfully so, but, uh, but surely there are people that do that. Well, here we see the humility, I guess you could say, of Peter and he's moved on and he's saying like, okay, now this person who's taken the leadership of the church of Jerusalem, where I used to be the leader and who Christ even gave me that position of leadership, he's now calling the shots. Okay. And I realize I might be reading it a little bit more than, you know, we have very clearly there, but for sure, this is the spirit in which a person in ministry, uh, this is what they should have. Look at Philippians 1.1. Oh, no, no. I, uh, I'm sorry. Acts 12. We're, we're going to go to Philippians 1.1, 1, 1, but i got to explain to you why. Okay, because uh, Acts 12, verse 17. Here's another thing to back up James being the pastor there. But he beckoning unto them with his hand to hold their peace. This is uh, Acts 12.17. Declared unto them how the Lord hath brought him out of the prison. No, this isn't right. What did I do here? Acts 12. 17. And he said, go, yeah, okay, he said, he said, go show these things unto James and to the brethren. And he departed and went into another place. Well, why isn't James one of the brethren? Okay. Now, I suppose there could be some speculation on that, but now let's compare that with Philippians 1 1. Now you can go there. <laughs> Philippians 1 1. Philippians 1.1 1, 1 says, Paul and Timotheus, that's who's writing this letter here. It says, the servants of Jesus Christ to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi, with the bishops and the deacons. Well, aren't the bishops and the deacons, you know, part of those who are saints in Philippi? Well, yeah, but he's listing them different. He's listing them separately because they are the heads of that church. Okay, so it makes sense why he... He said the James and the brethren, right? Because James is kind of distinctly, he, he's listed as different from that because he's the head over the brethren. That's what I, that's what I believe. Okay, but I want to uh, show you this. In this place in Philippians 1.1, 1, 1, I was reading one uh, commentary on this, um, and he was mentioning, I think it was Ma Matthew Henry, uh, which I, some, I enjoy reading some of his commentaries from, from way back. But uh, he said it's interesting that he lists the, all the saints that are at Philippi first and then the bishops and deacons after that. And he said, uh, and he said the reason why, of course, he's taken liberty to say he knows what the reason is, but it makes good sense. He's like, because these are the servants. So he's listing them last. They're the servants of the church, the bishops and the deacons. And you know, that's very true. A lot of times churches are kind of run like, I don't know, maybe it's not as big anymore, but you know, there has been times in history, let's say for sure. There's still today it goes on, but the, but the pastor is like the, the superstar of the church and he gets a special parking place and he gets this and that and and he gets the special office uh, you know the fancy office and he gets all these kinds of things because he's the you know he's that the main man and it is true and, and don't, don't get me wrong the bible does talk about honoring the uh, one that's laboring among you and all that kind of stuff but he also calls him an ox he's like hey don't muzzle the ox <laughs> that treads treadeth out the corn right what's an ox a servant okay so the pastor the minister it's right there in the title he's a minister his job is to minister to the people okay and so um 
So I find that very interesting here. And, and of course, this is what Jesus said. He said, hey, he who is the chiefest among you, let him be your servant. You know, uh, that, that, that's different. And what Jesus says in, uh, you don't have to go there, but Matthew 20, 25 through 28. And he says, hey, in the world, he just talks about the Gentiles, but he's like, in the world, they have this system where, you know, the person who is the greatest among them becomes their, their chief. He says, it's not like that in the kingdom of God. The greatest person is the one who's the most servant, you know, who's the, who's, who's the most serving among you. Now, that's really, he, that's kind of you uh, humbling to a pastor because he should never want everybody to be serving him. You know, and, and, and it's like he gets all this special rock star attention and stuff like that. No, actually, he should be doing everything he can to be treating the people that way. Now, I'm taking this personally because I'm the pastor uh, and I'm reading this and uh, how Peter is. Um, but I believe this is a great um, testimony and something, a great message for pastors today to, to listen to. Look at first, uh, 2 Corinthians 12. Now, the Apostle Paul was not uh, a pastor, but he is definitely a minister. Some would argue with me on the pastor thing, but um, 2 Corinthians 12. Verse 15. Uh, this shows Paul's heart, his heart of ministry. And I will very gladly spend and be spent for you, though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. Okay, so he's like, you know, he had problems with the church of Corinth. There were some churches that he seems to have had a sweeter spot in his heart for, and then there were others that, man, they were kind of a thorn in his flesh. Uh, but the church of Corinth gave him some problems. But he's like, you know what? I will gladly spend and be spent for you. Though the more I love you, the less you love me, <laughs> right? Which I, as a pastor and as a minister, I don't really feel that. Now, I will say that I, there were times I felt that when I was a youth pastor. Like, hey, you know what? They don't appreciate it, but just do it anyway. You're a minister. You love them. <laughs> and who cares? You love them. You love their families. And, and you had to kind of deal with that. As a pastor, I've had it really easy. I was talking the other day with Brother Allen. We sat down and we were talking. He actually was being an encouraged encouragement to me, but I, it's a long story, but, but I actually felt okay. But I told him, man, you know what? We're spoiled. I'm like, I, we really don't have it rough. There are a lot of churches where, um, man, the pastors like got ulcers just thinking about going to church, especially if there's a business meeting or something like that. And it hasn't been that way. It's been, it's been really a joy. Um, but you know what? The heart of a minister has to be the fact that I'm a minister. And when he signs up for it, he knows he's a minister. And one of my biggest pet peeves on face on Facebook posts that I see. And, uh, you know, every profession does this. OK, like if, if, if they're a nurse. You know, there's sometimes be posting posts about how much everybody ought to appreciate nurses and how they're not appreciated enough and how their job is so rough. Okay, now I'm not saying all nurses, but sometimes you'll see that and you'll be like, oh, come on, you're a nurse and you're saying this that doesn't sit really well. Okay, uh, firefighters will do the same thing and police officers will do the same thing. And, and, and I get it. I don't. It's a little bit of a pet peeve whenever they do it, but it's really a pet peeve when I see pastors doing it. And pastors are like, you don't know how hard your pastor has it, and you need to be praying for him, and you need to do this. And I'm like, it doesn't sit well that it's coming out of the mouth of a pastor. <laughs> it's like, you signed up for this job. You're going to be a minister. You're giving yourself to the people. Like, you need a little slap in the face and remember what you're doing. You know, you're a minister. Don't be putting stuff on Facebook about how rough your job is, okay? And so, uh, I mean, anybody could fall into it, but I'm just saying, like, no, pastors need to have this the attitude that's like, well, you know what? That's what I signed up for. If they don't love me, I'm just going to keep on loving them. You know? And so if you ever stop loving me, I'm just going to keep on loving you. Le Valor, remind me that I preach this whenever that happens. <laughs> okay, so, uh, uh, so the pastor is the bishop or the overseer of the church. But one thing about the spirit of Peter you know, just deferring to James, it wasn't a big deal whenever James took charge. That doesn't look like it was. And they were happy to go to James and ask him. They didn't have, they, they didn't have to ask Peter. 
a good application there is the fact that a, a pastor is the overseer when he's when he has that position he's the overseer of the church that he's pastoring okay but he's not the overseer of anybody else's business. <laughs> he's like, I, and I have to remind myself that, um, it's not very hard cause I don't really want to be in charge of anybody's lives, but I have to remind myself, my job is to set the standards for the church and say like, Hey, you know what? I'm going to make the final decision here. Here's what we're going to do. Maybe I'll ask advice or something like that, but I can make the decision for what goes on in this church service and, uh, policies and stuff like that. But I'm not going to oversee somebody's house you know, and what goes on in their house. I'm not going to fill out a questionnaire saying, Hey, do you allow this to go on in your house? And, and <laughs> do you guys believe in this? And do you accept, that's not my job. Okay. That's the husband's job. If there's a husband there or the father's job and, and he has that authority. And so if he disagrees with me on something and he teaches his family, something different than me, that shouldn't upset me. That shouldn't make me mad. He has every right to do that. As long as I stand firm on, you know, hey, here's what um, I believe is right before God to do in the church. Well, then I don't have to worry about what he does at home. And the same is true with someone else's ministry. Sometimes it's easy for us pastors to get our noses in other people's business and be like, well, that church over there, they should be doing this and they should be doing that. Well, you know what? You're not the pastor of that church. over there. So, uh, you know, we should be like Peter. <clears throat> Take charge where you're supposed to take charge, willingly, not by constraint, but understand that you're you you're a minister. You're ministering wherever you can, but you're not you're not a lord over anybody else's uh, house or any other one else's ministry. All right, so I guess uh, to make to give you an application, just for because I'm preaching to pastors and I'm the only pastor in the room, as far as I can tell. <laughs> It's kind of like, uh, it's kind of like the other day I was thinking I was all by myself and I was like, well, it's nice to be the smartest person in the room for one. <laughs> uh, uh, but anyway, <laughs> I'm the only pastor in here. So let me make an application for you. Okay. Number one, don't ever put your pastor on a pedestal. Okay. Now I'm, I love your pastor and I'll say this. You know, if another person takes over this church, I would say the same thing. Love your pastor, take care of him, um, and, and all those things. Show him honor. It says he's worthy of double honor if he w rules well and and labors in ministry and all that. But but don't put him on a pedestal. Like don't make him some kind of god. And and you know, uh, when we had the seventy anniversary seventieth anniversary, we put pictures of all the pastors up there. That's great. I didn't have any problem with that. But sometimes you'll go to a church and they've got just like engravings of men that have gone on before them and stuff like that. And, and sometimes that doesn't sit well with me. It's like, first of all, it's an engraving of a man. It's like you got an idol or something. In there, And then it's like, it's like, come on, that was a minister. Like it was, he, his job was to minister to you. You don't, he wasn't a president of the United States and all this kind of stuff, which he should be a servant too. But I'm just saying, um, you know, th that, that shouldn't be the, the role of your pastor and you shouldn't, you shouldn't labor. For, I mean, you shouldn't look for that. You know, if, if I'm not, if other people are just treat me like, Hey, I'm, I'm just a servant, you know, I'm, I'm not, he's not like this great sought after preacher or he's not the, you know, well, that's good because that's not what you need. <laughs> All right. And so don't put me on a pedestal or make me out to be uh, somebody greater than I should be. Be grateful for for the ministry and, and for those the work that's being done, but don't ever put your pastor on a pedestal. And then number two, just allow them, and you guys are, I'm so thankful that you do this, but allow them to make decisions that are theirs to make. You know what I mean? If the policies of the church or what goes on in the church or how a service is conducted or those kind of service, just allow the pastor to make that's his, that's his, um, he's not, he's not getting his nose in your business. Now I might preach a message that steps on your toes. That's different, but I'm not going to go, you know, judge you on what you do at home or anything like that. And, uh, and so just that if we all just kind of 
play our position, so to speak, everything goes well. It's just kind of like at home. I'm the head of the house. Um, that doesn't mean I get my nose in every business that my wife does, but I'm the final say at what goes on at the house. And, and, uh, and we just respect that. And we, and we work with that and it makes everything go well. And so the same thing with pastor in a church. Now I'm not, I didn't preach this at all to like, because something's going on or anything like that. I was just really looking into Peter as being the first head of the, not, not Pope, but the first head of the, <laughs> of the church. And I thought it was a neat little study. Let's go to Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for the ministry and thank you for calling me into the ministry. Um, of course, at this point in my life, I just don't know, uh, no matter what else I did with my life, I feel like that would always be a part of it. It would have to be. And that's because I feel like you've called me to that. And, and sure, all Christians have a, have ministry and, and we're all called to something, but, um, but I do, um, feel very honored and privileged that I could be in a leadership position over one of your churches. And, and I pray Lord that you'll help me take that, um, take that seriously and to do better, to, to lead well and, and to, uh, uh, take the oversight as I'm supposed to. And I thank you for the, uh, our members, uh, both here and in Kansas city, those who, um, who are, loyal to their pastor and love their pastor. And I sure am thankful for that. I pray you bless them for that. And I pray that you'll bless your church as we seek to do your work and continue moving forward, living by faith. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, let's stand.